everybody, and welcome to Deep in the Bush with Peter Allison. Today I'm joined by Court Whelan, uh, somebody whose path I should have crossed a thousand times over and we just somehow have managed to sidestep each other. So not having met you, Court, you've got a very, very lengthy bio and I can't even remember it all, so I'm going to check my notes here. <laughs> sure, prefer, sure. <laughs> do you prefer to be known as a photographer, a nature guide, conservationist, public speaker, ecologist, or as one source told me, a teller of really shit jokes about insects. Oh, you want it, You want the very first insect joke? Is that what you're referencing here? No, I'm not asking for that. I've, I've been warned about these. I just, oh, yeah, yeah. Which is the hat you prefer to wear, or are you happy wearing all of those hats? You know, it's kind of like, I think it's my own hat uh, that I've sort of designed, melding all that stuff together. Uh, yeah, I'd say, you know, a conservation biologist that gets people out there to learn about the natural world and to save it by experiencing it. Like, that's kind of the hat I've woven throughout many, many years of, of various customization and study and whatnot. So, yeah, let, let's just say all of it. M many hats oh, or one nice. weird Frankenstein hat. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, listen, I know that as well. And people ask what it is do for a living and particularly when you're out of the niche world that we live in it's like oh it's so hard to explain that i'm a little bit of a safari guide and an occasional writer um and i'm mainly a, a safari pimp as i put it i'm most of my work is actually trying to convince people to come on safari because that's conservation yeah just big people safari is conservation so um all right well we're going to start off so that the uh, People watching, listening can get to know you a bit better as well. These are all ambush questions. These are not ones you've got any prep for here. Um, so just straight off the bat here, what animal scares you? Uh, mosquitoes. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, just a little, I'm actually not too scared of them uh, just because I am an entomologist. I get it. But, yeah, I mean, if you want to point your finger at the world's most dangerous animal other than humans, it would be a big mosquito. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's one of those little things that people just don't realize is stat once um, that said malaria has killed more people than anything ever. I believe that, unfortunately. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. even today, uh, it's still around. It's just, you know, it's it's old news or whatever. It's just not topical. It's not it's not what sells the ads on TV, you know, to hear about that stuff. But it's still a big, big problem. Yeah, it, it wasn't that long ago that in Say so in Texas, uh, 1906, I think it was, the biggest killer of the poor was malaria. Oh, geez, no kidding. To, to think of. So that's very recent history. All right, so you get to resurrect one extinct species. What do you choose? Oh, T Rex. T Rex, <laughs> where are you going to put it? <laughs> Go for T Rex. <laughs> I mean, I want to see if this thing has feathers, if it's actually a hunter, yeah. and, uh, you know. If it feeds on dead things, it, yeah, T-Rex for sure. That would be bitterly disappointing if it turns out it just chased roadkill. Yeah, yeah, and it's got like pink feathers all over it. Like, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's got a Mardi Gras of dinosaurs. <laughs> Who's your conservation hero? Hmm, jeez. Um, I'm going to, I'll split it between, uh, Alexander von Humboldt. Love that guy. He kind of yeah. pioneered some stuff and we'll say, you know, modern day EO Wilson, uh, Ed, Ed Wilson, right, yeah. a fantastic godfather of biodiversity. I think, um, much like you, he's, is a scientist and naturalist and a writer. And I think that, you know, he gets it, you get it. It's like, you've got to get information out to the public. You can't just keep it in your brain. And even like me, like you're, you, we love doing this on safari with eight people at a time, but it's that that mix, that translation from the science world into the popular world that I think is super duper important. And he does it quite well. Yeah. Yeah. I think science communication in this era where there seems mm -hmm. to be a war on science. Yeah. That with, with that going on, mm -hmm. science communication that can either popularize it, dumb it down if need be, just to, you know, the, the sweet and candy to get people, lure them in. Oh, that sounds creepier than I wanted it to. <laughs> <laughs> Can we you say? You're like that windowless uh, white van, basically. You know, that's yeah, that's mean. right. <laughs> you got one of those too. Yeah, standard issue. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, and he's amazing at that. And I also proposed the idea of setting aside half the world as wilderness. Yeah. Not as crazy as it sounds when you consider how much mass Antarctica already takes up. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, he says it's, it's, it's a moonshot, but we need moonshot. Yeah. We, we, you know, you you aim for the stars and you land on a mountain. You know, we don't need to just save another 5%. Yeah. We need to save a ton. And if we don't get to it, at least we're going to make some pretty monumental victories along the way. Yeah, and that's that's huge. And I, I love that idea of the moonshot as well. Uh, what's your favorite animal to photograph? And I've seen a lot of your photos and I'm, I am... I'm normally envious of people. It's like, wow, what a one. I wish I could have done that. Then there's jealousy where I wish the person ill. Like, <laughs> I so much want that, and you've had it. I slightly dislike you for it. I'm kind of <laughs> eating. Yes, there you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got my uh, caught wild dog here that I've been stabbing all day. Um, right, right. They're, they're up there. I mean, wild dogs, uh, yeah. golly, they're just, when you get the perfect pick, it's just so rewarding. You know, so I, I guess I, I might have to name two. I'd say like the most thing, the thing that I would love to photograph again uh, would be one of the tarsiers of Southeast Asia. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's because I've been, I've been looking for them. They're so weird. They're so charismatic. I got, I got the chance of a lifetime a couple of years ago. I got some pretty darn good photos, but you can never have too many. Um, so I'd like like that as far as like coveted next thing, but you know, as far as what I can just go back and photograph over and over and over again, uh, I had to say monarch butterflies, you know, their migration sure. down to Mexico. Yeah. It's just, it's so dynamic, you know, for one species, one thing, you can see it and live it and hear it and everything in so many different ways. And it's, it's one of those things that I, I don't think the world at large has really caught on to how magnificent it is. I mean, everybody yes. kind of knows like, oh yeah, trekking with mountain gorillas would be really cool. I definitely want to do that. Like that's on my, you know, huge bucket list. Um, but monarchs, like they're still kind of unknown as to like how, remarkable that occurrences and and it's fun because i i honestly humbly think that you know out of my more or less 20 years of guiding down there and the, the research i've done I, I might actually have more photos of the monarch migration than like maybe anybody else just because yeah, yeah. You know, and so but it's partly because i want to save them partly because i've had the opportunity but part, partly just like i love photographing those little guys they're incredible there's something you, you said that that really triggered a response with me as you said hearing them and that's just it is yeah. the between the, the photograph, the documentary, and actually being there and realizing to hear butterflies seems incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. yeah. but there's so many it makes a noise, and I've, I've never witnessed that, and I would love to, love to. You know, this, there's these other great migrations, the wildebeest and the Serengeti Mara. Uh, that's not Africa's biggest migration, not by a long shot. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of biomass, still not there. You know, there's the locusts. The coast. No, it's the sardine run off the coast of South Africa and around, which attracts whales and sharks and dolphins, and it's immense. It's just a bit more unpredictable. So they haven't been able to capitalize on it from a tourism experience. Did not, did not know that. That's interesting. Yeah, and it, it's one of the great migrations on the planet, along with the monarchs and uh, the birds coming out of Europe and the Middle East down, and then the, the American migration of birds that, goes up through Central America. So, yeah, there's all these amazing migrations of the world. Yeah. And we still don't know about a lot of them. I mean, I remember, um, you know, so a couple of times I've had the opportunity to meet E.O. Wilson, Ed, Ed Wilson, um, and, you know, he loves giving advice to students and uh, other, you know, younger generations. And he's like, he, he's always pushing me to, like, study more of the world's migrations because he will say, you know, first – First and foremost, that's one of the things we understand the least of in this world is all the different critters that migrate, where, how, when, yeah. and why. So, yeah, you, you can get on his good side if you study migrations. <laughs> well, I think also the disruptions to those and the knock-on effects they all mm -hmm. have. Um, I mean, it, we know that Botswana had a comparable migration to the Serengeti Masai Mara until the late 60s, and it was just a group of fences cut it off. Hundreds of thousands of animals piling up died, and it was it was good for vultures, and that was it. Uh, yeah. Fortunately, there's positive there. There's a comeback. The numbers are coming back. Um, but I'm I'm questioning you. I shouldn't be talking so much. Okay, so here's a tricky one for you. You're the last man on the planet. What species do you take as a lover? Mm, man, uh, I would have to say uh, Homo sapien. Yeah, I'm still. I'm, I'm <laughs> it. You're not going to catch me there. It's a trick question. That's the right answer, right? Yeah. <laughs> Listen, it's up to you. To know. I'm always curious to see what people's response to that is, whether they're a uh, kind of thing you, you do sitting around a campfire, it's eleven o'clock at night, and 
people have had a few too many whiskies under their belts. Like, all right, so because I, mean, I used to live in the bush seven days a week, work seven days a week, three months straight. Mm-hmm. And at three months, you're pretty lonely and you'd start going, oh, why are they all so fast? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those cute little Impalas with those big doe eyes. I get it. You know? Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of pretty animals out there. <laughs> um, okay, so here's a one playing to your PhD in entomology. What's the difference between a bug and an insect? Ah, uh, it's great. So uh, all bugs are insects. Not all insects are bugs. So there's about 29 different orders of insects out there all under a big group of arthropods and then the insecta which is the or sometimes it's called the hexapoda six leg um so right. all insects are that um but then bug is just one of those orders actually it's only the the bugs the true bugs as they call them and they're the the hemipterans or sometimes they're known as heteropterans they're like the little bugs you see sucking the sap out of plants like the things that introduced diseases to grapes way back when that's a, that's a true bug um Cicadas are true bugs. Yep. Um, stink bugs are true bugs. Uh, those little things you see on milkweed plants, those are true bugs. But th- it's like, if I were to guess, it's probably, you know, by way of number of species, f- 5% of all insects. So when you say, you know, you've uh, you got a bug in your house, it's almost definitely not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I've, I've heard people say, you know, it's a spider. And they go, yep, a bug. Mm. Well, that's a whole other ball of wax, you know, spiders, uh, just, insects, yeah. or bugs, but... But yeah, uh, you yeah. have a cockroach, not a bug, fly, not a bug. But, you know, language is a funny thing. We all say things because we think everybody else knows what we mean. And everybody knows what we mean when we say a bug. So we'll uh, say And that's just it. But it is one of those ones I think people don't realize that it isn't a blanket for all creepy, crawly right. invertebrates. I mean, it's, it's often lumped. You know, I, even in, I know, I grew up in Sydney and there's a crustacean unique to Sydney Harbour and it's just called the Balmain bug. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And of course, oh, mud bug? not that at all. Same thing yeah. as mud bug? Uh, yep, they yeah. serve in restaurants as, you know, chunks. Uh, yeah. You know, kind of a lobster substitute. Uh, right, I, I, I've had them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right, right. And, and the thing, bug is not just a, a colloquialism either. either. It's actually a term. It's it's a real thing. You know, it's it's not just yeah. some common name. Like, you can actually refer to something as a bug and be totally correct. Um, you just have to have a little bit of ID uh, taxonomy training. Yeah. yeah, that's right. You've got to narrow your focus a little. Yeah. Like their antennae yeah, and the mouth part structure. And <laughs> uh, do they all? Do all bugs have uh, not necessarily proboscis, but a, a hardened mouthpiece to pierce? Uh, yes, that is one of the characteristics of true okay. bug. Is they have right. that proboscis. It's like a thing that comes out. It's like a drinking straw. You yeah. Know. Now, you know, I- those and a lot of flies also have similar stuff like that. Um, butterflies, the Lepidoptera, they have yeah. their own little drinking straw. So again, it's like, it's all of our, you know, tr- attempt to classify things. And yes, so all, all bugs do have that little proboscis. Um, yeah. And most of them try to drink um, like sap out of the, the xylem of plants, basically. So that's that's why some of them are treated as pests is because they can introduce diseases, kind of like how a, a mosquito would introduce a disease. Yeah. Yeah. But, doing but that's not us. Not us. They're yeah. totally yeah. harmless for the most part. Yeah. It's like, one or two species that do something bad in South America. <laughs> Don't worry okay. about that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's a favorite place of mine, so maybe I need to be concerned. Okay, this is probably the most controversial question I've got for you uh, in the time we're taking today. Canon or Nikon? Mm, Canon, yeah. Okay. Uh, but I respect no. all. I respect all. <laughs> um, I get it. Uh, but I love to hear when people do have arguments for one or the other, because like, I actually view them as both very much the same. <laughs> um, but I don't know what what are you, are you Canon or Nikon or, or what are the others? I'm I'm not the photographer that you are. Okay, I, okay. I, I've been blessed with opportunity, just just such an abundance of opportunity. I've managed to get some photos that I'm I'm pretty happy with. Um, but it's just I mean, at one point I was seeing leopards two three times a day every day. Mm. If you don't get at least one decent shot. Um, you probably went to the Stevie Wonder School of Photography. Uh, <laughs> but, and, but that was Canon, and I'm still with Canon because it's what I've got, and it's a little like with phones now. I don't want to switch phone brands because it's like learning another language. And Oh, yeah. No, you can't do it. Yeah. Get. No, I mean, so, it's so funny. Like, So I'll lead photo trips, and I have all you know shapes and sizes of cameras that guests come with, and they say, hey, can you figure out how to do this in this camera? 
So I become versed in like the the nuances and the differences, but it's still it really is like you'll never become fluent like a, you know in a foreign language unless you're unless you're immersing yourself. Um, and it's it's funny you know between Canon and Nikon, literally um, everything physical is the opposite. So like the way you zoom or the way you focus is clockwise or counterclockwise. It's like they yeah. did that intentionally. They're like, no, we know these right brain people are gonna do this, or these left handed people will go. <laughs> I don't know, but that, you know, I, I'm not a hater. They're all, they're all good. <laughs> I know. And that's just it. It's, um, it, it, I find a lot of these arguments absolutely ridiculous and it really plays to human tribalism. Mm-hmm. Where, of course it's how my sport and, and it, I find it incredible. I'm, I'm in the UK now that you get the game of soccer or football and Real tribes have formed around those. And for a game where you know they fall over and they hurt their anky and need a stretcher to come off, mum gives them a kiss and then they come back on. Yeah. And so it's, it's to me, it's quite namby-pamby. It's like the kids that weren't tough enough to do ballet end up playing soccer. <laughs> I'm a rugby guy. <laughs> I, I, I was going to ask. That was my follow-up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But then in the crowd, you have violence that the UFC could only dream about. Mm-hmm. And, your tribalism so and that it's around cameras as well is one of the nerdiest ones oh, totally. it's, it's a team it's a sports team there a yeah. comedian said this one time that i thought was so funny is, is speaking of you know he or she i forget who it was had this whole bit around you know the fanaticism of like football soccer baseball whatever teams and you know like i can't believe people like will literally fight people in parking lots from the other team <laughs> because they're yeah. so they're so adamant and and they said you know this is a group of 12 people in a case of soccer or whatever, or like a group of 90 people in case of American football that if they met you, they probably wouldn't like you <laughs> and you're putting your life on the line. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, why, yeah. why do you like that? Like they, they probably wouldn't, they probably wouldn't give you the time of day. So anyway, yeah, I, I get it. It's, I get it. it is a particular insanity. Um, and it, it's, it's interesting whether we see that in any animals at all. We ultimately, we, we know with the primates that we see, culture mm-hmm. their tribalism within the broader groups and it's very hard for you to baboons we see in some really big numbers and there's definitely right. factions so is that the start of tribalism and, and you know, do humans actually seek that out as some ancient need that we have totally i i, I yes I do feel because, you know, what you're doing is you're creating a community, you're creating identity. And I'll tell you, you know, when I was back in college and I used to go tailgating on football Saturdays at my university, like it's a really interesting feeling because you just, you see 90,000 other people that you've never met that you might not like, um, but you all have something vehemently in common that you can go up to anybody on this campus. That's, you know, five square miles almost hundred thousand people. And you can high five anybody that day if you're wearing the same shirt and they, they love you, yeah. they give you food, <laughs> they give you drinks and they high five you, you play games. So yeah, there's definitely, um, what it is is like that trait probably was retained in our genetics. And that's what got us to the next level and the next level and the next level is because we form communities to protect us, you know, against famine, against intruders, predators, drought, whatever. I, I do think, yeah, there's probably a lot going on there. Um, yeah. You know, and now we, we've just found far more mundane things to be tribal about. And Yeah. And yeah. Have I told you how terrible Nikon is as a Canon, as a camera platform? <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't get me started on those Johnny come lately's with Olympuses. Ooh. Uh, yeah. Olymp- Olymp- Olympi. <laughs> right. All right. So there's, there's something we do on Deep in the Bush with everybody, uh, which is a segment which is Make Wayne Care. And Wayne is a man from Indiana, from the town of Wayne, appropriately enough, in Indiana. And so imagine I do not care about conservation. I don't care about the years you spent studying. Uh, I'm Wayne from Indiana. I'm a good guy, but I've got a few secrets that I normally wouldn't share. I sing along the Nickelback. Uh, There was that one time with Brenda. I still like Brenda, but I think she likes Scott from accounting. I worry about bugs on my lawn, hate wasps. When I was seven, a bee stung me. If there's a spider in my house, I know I can put a jar over and take it out, but it's also much easier just to hit it with my tasseled loafer. Make me care about bugs. Ooh, that's a, that's a great one. That's, I like that. Good, good phrasing around the question. Well, so we'll start off by saying, you know, bugs do kind of rule the world. They've been here well before us. They've been, they will be here well after us. Um, they, you know, invented and discovered some of the things that we rely on. We still learn from them in a big way. I mean, you know, the, the leaf cutter ant was probably one of the very first farmers this planet's ever seen. They farm little fungus underground. 
Um, and believe it or not, probably most of what we have as far as uh, medicine, as far as technology, as far as education has some only like one degree of separation from bugs. Like they're, they're related in somehow, whether they pollinate the, the plants that give us our medicines that allow us to have the Advil and the Tylenol or the cancer curing drugs. Yeah. Um, and I think what it all comes down to is uh, diversity and sheer numbers in terms of like what's so special about bugs. They are the most numerous critters in the planet. Just ants and termites alone represent about 30% of the world's biomass. The world but they biomass. Also, it's, it's the thing. That's another one that people, yeah, calling a termite a white ant is entirely wrong, isn't it? They're not closely related. No, no, no. Very, very, uh, very dissimilar. They're in totally different orders. They have both yeah. commonly evolved uh, what we call eusociality, which is this ability to like have, you know, colonies and brood care and the whole queens and soldiers caste system. But yeah, totally separate. Um, but, you know, so yeah, good, good point. But, you know, the idea and enemies are, and enemies. I mean, you have extraordinary battles with actual tactics. Oh, totally. Yeah. I mean, they, yeah. and you know, there are certain termites that uh, they're called Nasut warriors, the, and Nasut like a nose, and they don't have mm -hmm. jaws or big pinchers. They literally just wait on the sidelines and they have these cannons coming out of their face that spit like a turpentine like chemical and it'll blind the intruders. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of fascinating stuff. So, of course, you know, okay, yeah. bugs are cool. Like, I like them. Maybe you don't because they did something bad, you know, to your brother's cousin a few years ago. Uh, that's fine. But, you know, at the very end of the day, they make the world go round. They are the engineers of our world, of our society. The reason you have a green lawn, the reason you have apples to eat, the reason you have that steak for dinner all comes down to bugs as providing this free service to humans. And I think at the end of the day, you know, this goes for all conservation, but, you know, let's whittle it down to conservation of bugs. Let's save ourselves first. Like, like I get it. Like let's work yeah. preservation of the species. Let's, let's preserve this species. But in order to do so, we can't just take all the other species that came before us and got us to where we are. We can't just take them out of the equation and expect to engineer our way to water filtration and to nutrients in the soil and clean air. Like, Everything in the world makes this happen because it's been happening for, you know, better part of a billion years. Um, so, yeah, you know, sa save us first. Um, but it, and then the last thing I'll say is that, you know, and Ed Wilson uh, put this in one of his books, which I thought was fascinating. This is back in 2001 it was published. So 20 years ago, he calculated that the value of the ecosystem services that bugs and trees and little nematodes in the soil that all of life provides for humans, you know, to pollinate our crops and to uh, purify drinking water just because of how the world works and the percolation through the soil and whatnot. Each year, we would have to spend about $30 trillion, trillion with a T, to yeah. mirror those services. Um, we don't got that. <laughs> we yeah, won't. Absolutely. That. Yeah. And it's like 60 million in today's currency. And remember, this is like 20 years ago. So if you think about like, you know, inflation and accuracy and all that. So anyway, bugs are an integral part of the equation because they make the world go round. And yeah, you can take one spider out of the equation. You can take one roach out of the equation, um, but you can't do so in mass without affecting your own health and your own livelihood and the livelihood of your future generations and progeny and kids and, and all that. Um, so yeah, as much as much as you can live and let live and you'll notice that your home is healthier, your air is healthier, everything's healthier. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's astonishing. And again, I, I think people don't realize how key they are. We're getting more news about bees, and that's wonderful that we're hearing how important bees are. Just if you just say to people, you're going to be paying twice as much for your food if we have no bees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, twice as much. That's, that's a knock on effect. Yeah, and, and you're going to have a far limited, more limited range of the foods that you eat, fewer fruits, fewer vegetables. It's a big deal not to have bees. And people, I think, are coming to terms with that. Um, but again, the, these collapses of ecosystems, you consider how many birds and so on feed on insects, bats, obviously, as mm -hmm. well. They are so, so integral to the web of life. Yeah, yeah they are. And that's actually, I was, I was on, as an aside, that's kind of, people often ask me, like, why I got into entomology. And I'm actually not, like, that bug nerd as a kid. I mean, I, I did, you know, like, maybe, like, watched ants on the sidewalk and, like, collected a few yeah. things. I wasn't, like raised by entomologists or people like to go, you know, a lot of people are, um, really what it is, is exactly what you said, where insects and bugs fit in, in that, what we call a trophic pyramid, you know? So bug mm -hmm. insects, uh, I'll call them bugs too. It's, it's totally yeah. fine. Um, you know, they, they, uh, they either eat or are eaten 
by everything in the world. Meaning like they have a connection with almost every single level there um, because they eat the plants, they pollinate the plants, the things above them eat them. And even some of the higher up things, you know, grizzly bears coming out of hibernation, what's the first thing they gorge on? Moths. They're mo most really? right after hibernation is moths. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where are they finding those? Uh, the on trees. And yeah, yeah, they'll just, they'll dig under rocks for grubs, they'll eat them off the trees. Um, okay. Yeah, like, wow. like many, many, many pounds and kilograms of these moths because their emergence, the moths emergence is about timed with when the grizzlies come out of hibernation. Right. It's a little bit early for the plants to have berries and seeds and yep. you know, yeah, edible tubers and whatnot. But it's also that's, that's protein. So that's, I imagine. Perfect, that perfect protein and fat. Like, yeah. it's with, you know, ideal yeah. nutrients. So the thing is, is like, you know, you might think, okay, well, great. We get a bunch of rats and we weasels, you know, feeding on insects. It's not the case. Like everything feeds on them because they are, yeah. they are kind of like the, you know, the lobsters of the terrestrial world. They're delicious and they're healthy and all. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever eaten termites, but uh, I've had them just fried up in butter and they've got this nutty, really delicious taste. There's um, when I lived and worked in Botswana, uh, there's a, a day every year, normally early December, just after the first rains where the winged termites come out of the alleys mm -hmm. uh, is, it's a rough day to be in luxury tourism because people have an expectation of they, they're imagining, <laughs> but no, it is just uh, it is it's like smog, but it's winged termites and they're completely harmless. Yeah, um, but it is off-putting for people that aren't expected or aren't used to it. But it is it's pretty much a day, maybe thirty-six hours. Wow! But there are certain tribes in the area that if the chief's wife was pregnant would stimulate they would fake rainfall over a certain colony of termites just pour water and water and water over it till they released it because there's so much protein it's 750 grams of termites has the same protein as a kilo of lean beef wow that's amazing so, yeah and it's and it's a hell of a lot easier it might sound quite labor intensive to do that but that's a hell of a lot easier than hunting a buffalo an 800 kilo buffalo that will kill you yeah you don't exactly have quite the same negative ramifications if you screw that up you know <laughs> yeah being, I, I've, been, I've, been charged, I've been charged by termites and buffaloes and i know which one i prefer yeah right yeah <laughs> end times out of uh, yeah for sure yeah no, i love that that's, that's a great story I'll, I'll have to use that i like the whole simulating rain thing that's fascinating yeah so, yeah, so, yeah, yeah the, 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 the released. And you, you also in Southern Africa get Mopani worms, which uh, I've had yeah. before, which are fantastic. There, I mean, there will be a day in the future when we eat insects quite a bit more. Um, you know, it, I, I don't know how you pronounce it. It's entomophagy, entomophagy. I don't know how it's. Yeah, it's tomato, tomato. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, I've already seen um, there is this uh, material or this product called cricket flour, and you can buy it on Amazon. It's literally just a very proteinaceous flour made out of ground up crickets. Apologies to any, any yeah. vegans or vegetarians, but um, yeah. And it's like super, super nutritious. It's extremely sustainable because you can cultivate and farm these things um, with a very little greenhouse gas effect. You get a ton of protein. So yeah, there, there will be a time when we're all into that stuff. Do you want to disappoint the vegans and vegetarians or should I with the um, red food dye? Yeah, go, go ahead. Uh, that's a funny one. <laughs> so it's it's one of these little known things. So, you know, in, a, in a recent interview, I was talking about how lipstick has a is firmed up with a byproduct of sewage treatment uh, is one of the things they use to make it solid. But most red dyes, I believe to this day, are actually made with a byproduct of insects. So it's cochineal. Co it's co yeah, it's another tomato, tomato, cochineal or cochineal. Yeah, it's like yeah. a C-O-C, like double C thing. So it depends yeah. if you're from Italy or not, I guess. <laughs> so um, I'm definitely not. But um, so, yeah, and that is where to this day most of the red food dye comes from because it's easy yeah. and it's cheap. And that is a bug. That's a true bug. Yeah. Oh, right. Scale, okay. Scale, there you scale go. Are true bugs. Yeah. And you'll see it. Um, yeah. So the way I learned about that was a number of years ago, Starbucks came out with some strawberry frappa something or other, and they claimed it was vegan and they got sued and they had to pay wow. like $5 million because they had red dye number five or whatever it is. And that has uh, a bit of that extract. And, and I, I don't 
I don't do this, but like you can, you can find them on plants and, and cacti. And all you do is if you just like rub them a little bit, you kind of like, it, it does, you do have to kill them. If you, if you squat, yeah. It's just like this blood red color. It's not actual blood. It's more like a defensive compound. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very evident. Um, yeah. I, bet, I mean, it's something going back to what you were saying earlier is the, the, how much we use animals and how much we're even using insects, which people don't realize. Mm -hmm. Any lives. I actually had a great, a, red, a great example recently. And I think it's always surprising when you hear of a positive environmental story out of China. Um, they're epic polluters and, I mean, eating bats. Now we know how bad that is for the world. We mm. should have done already and uh, the possible association with pangolins and endangered species. But this genius idea was um, a cockroach farmer. And I was read this article about, and he takes food waste from restaurants, from supermarkets, gets that for pretty much zero. He feeds termites. He just has them in a great big warehouse that's kept at the right temperature. And that they are ground down and given to chickens, as similar to your cricket flour, as a high protein feed for them, zero antibiotics, zero hormones in it. Apparently the chickens absolutely love it. Wow. Uh, and, and you just go, what a winner. That's amazing. I love it. I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, so I, I actually had chickens for my first few years here in Boulder, six of them in my backyard from the, the gals I was renting from. And yeah, you see it uh, when we let them out to do some free range during the day, yeah. you see a cockroach scurry in the ground and that thing is not around for more than a split second. They're just yeah. they're triggered by that. Like that is a, some sort of ancestral food source because <laughs> they go nuts. And also funny other side is, so I often get questions like, well, how do you get to become a guide? How do you get to like this really yeah. cool lifestyle? Um, well, it's, it's been a lot of really weird jobs throughout. And one of my main jobs in college was I took care of the entomology department's cockroach room uh, for years. <laughs> and every day yeah. I'd have to yeah. go in there and just big vats, like huge Rubbermaid bins that you would store like sweaters in just full of cockroaches because it's kind of like the main source uh, for any uh, sort of studies you want to do, whether it's like looking at their morphology, whether it's, uh, you yeah. know, an outbreak and you want to test certain things. And so they had to keep like big colonies of like every major cockroach species of the world. <laughs> and so wow. like maybe a hundred bins uh, and I had to go in there and, you know, the smell uh, was extraordinary. I can still smell cockroach pheromones to this day. If I walk into a house, I'm like, I think you have cockroaches. Um, but uh, <laughs> you know, and they, they live in these like cardboard rolls and you have to change it out. And then you got to find the like the little water thing that's buried in like all their, anyway. So it, it's that yeah. kind of stuff that got me to become yeah. a guide. It was, I had an. And that's, I mean, I have, uh, again, much like you would, where people are saying, oh, you live this amazing life. And, and yeah, it is. It is fantastic what we get to do, the things we get to see. But it is also work and you don't just pitch up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had any number of, crap job literally dealing with crap at certain times oh yeah yeah cockroach crap at a camp and they say the first thing you're told is not go out on safari it's that septic system has broken down you need to dig it out yeah uh, <laughs> right. guess i'm the new guy the, uh, the guys the price of admission <laughs> yeah and i think we've all done that to to get to and and the reality is when you are somewhere like a safari camp or the places you're going to get these amazing photos is there is nobody to phone. Mm -hmm. There is you know, the 24 hour service of the person comes out. So you are a plumber, you're an electrician, particularly bad at that one. Um, you're whatever it needs be. I mean, one of my first jobs in Botswana was go and change a cistern in what was then a tent and the bathroom walls were just made out of reeds. And the cistern was just held on with bits of wire and I had to go and Change out everything inside it. I'd never taken the lid off one before. Yeah. Rather sheltered childhood, obviously. And uh, I, I changed it all, wired it up, took a look, stood back, smiled, and it promptly just fell off, smashed, and it was the last one. So I had to go to my tent where I just had a plastic one, um, wrap it in canvas to make it look prettier, sure. go on in it, and live without a toilet in my tent until a new one could be trucked out, which only came once a month. Man. Uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of embarrassing midnight runs. That's that's the kind of life you live, and that's that's what people don't understand is they see the glamour front of house. Right. Any one of these ecotourism places is an iceberg. And what yeah. they're saying is 
the tip behind oh, it. You know, it's it's engineered to look a certain way for sure. Yeah. And then, you know, it's all the behind the scenes stuff is behind the scenes for a reason, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You don't you don't want to stroll back there too often. When people are like, wow, I can't believe it, what amazing food, what amazing cuisine, and like how comfortable it is in the middle of nowhere. Let me tell you what goes into it. <laughs> a yeah. lot. Yeah, a lot of work to get it to that. I'm I'm pretty happy saying that yeah, who I work with, I I'd walk you through any of the kitchens. I probably wouldn't work you into the walk into the workshop. Um, right. I mean, they're, they're, that is where true miracles are performed on a daily basis, where mm -hmm. they're held together with coat hangers and parts of toilets. I've right. literally the radiator of a car once, parts of a toilet to keep it running for just one game drive. <laughs> I know that. Um, as a sustainability guy, I often get, you know, the question like, well, when are you going to introduce electric safari vehicles? And I say, you know, trust me, I want to, like, that's great. It's definitely the future at some point, but also think about for a second, what happens, you know, we, we need Land Rovers and Land Cruisers that we can fix with, you know, two thumbtacks, some chewing gum and duct tape. Um, yeah. you know, Tesla batteries are a little bit more complicated than that. <laughs> um, but yeah, they are, they're, they're, they are, those systems are coming in to run the camps rather than generators. Solar's come a long, long way. Mm -hmm. um, and they're, they're certainly not cheap. Uh, yeah. It's a million dollars at least per safari camp to get yeah. them on solar. Um, but it's, it's a better way. I mean, again, when I started out you know, mid 90s in Botswana, it was diesel generators chugging away and belching fumes. And then the, if you wanted to shower, we'd bring in firewood, um, deny several termites, millions of termites a meal, and burn that to heat water for you for your shower. And right. don't stay in there for more than 20 minutes if you'd like it hot. Yeah. <laughs> Second shower, please. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, Shafi, I'm back to your photography. I, I, photography as a storytelling element mm -hmm. is something that I think people don't – understand that how powerful an image can be. It can provoke just a smile. It can provoke or, um, I mean, I certainly know that conflict photography can change people's minds. How do you feel about camera trap photography winning awards? Mm, that's, that's a good one. That's, a, that's appropriate too. Cause didn't one just win like yeah, the, the big photograph the, of the year of that tiger yeah. that was, um, yeah, yeah beautiful shot. Great question. So I, I've actually been thinking about this for the better part of a few days and a week. And it's, you know, the, the knee jerk reaction is, oh, no, you know, we put so much time and so much money and so much effort. And these guys are just going out with, you know, a, a tortoise shell and a camera underneath it. And they're getting these amazing shots. It's tempting to say that, but I I don't agree with it. I, I actually think it's totally fine. Um, I think it's totally fine to win awards. And I think you have to break it down into its elements. Well, what what is an award? You know, it's not like a bunch of people just yeah. sitting around being like, Hey, I just feel like giving a bunch of money away. No, it's because this photo is impactful. It's beautiful. It's extraordinary. Um, and it's, uh, it's compelling to a wide audience is usually the big thing. You know, the reason it wins an award is because not just two obscure artists from, you know, Nova Scotia think it's great. It's, it's like the masses believe this is beautiful. So let's show it off. So I think that what camera traps can do um, is showcase animals, rare, rare animals in rare places doing rare things and educate and inspire the world in a big way. So, I, I mean, I think for the very <laughs> underlying purpose, like it's a great thing. It does set an interesting precedent, you know? So like now, yeah. now is it going to be like the next drone where like everybody can buy these little beetle cams and, and now it's going to be illegal to set up game cameras out there. I mean, it, it probably is already in certain places, so yeah, I mean there there is definitely some question of like what will this lead? But I bet you back in the day, you know, the first person that engineered his or her own big 400 millimeter telephoto lens, you know, all the guys without lenses were like, oh, that's cheating. You don't even have to get yeah. close to the wildlife. You yeah. know, we used to have to go sleep underneath this hide and and wait for this. And so like technology is always going to emerge and. You know, you can't be too surprised in this er era of drones and all this wild technology that it was inevitable for this to happen. So, yes, I think it's fine. You know, I'm sorry to those people that uh, do sit out in hides for five weeks with, you know, yeah. hard to pee in. Like that's that's really difficult conditions. And well, this, you know, this person just goes and sets a trap and then has dinner for the night. But, um, you know, <laughs> that's Sorry. You've actually changed my mind with this because I was I was a bit off put by it. I was thought, oh, it's kind of cheating, but um, 
I, I was actually imagining that that person had to figure out the likely place, figure out the composition, which is a huge part of the photography, find the likely spot, get the camera at the right angle, and then, as all photographers do, hope for the best. Yeah, and remind me, a, a friend of mine years back was guiding a, a daughter of a US president, and so she had a Secret Service detail, which was just one guy there. Uh, it had to accompany on all of the game drives, all the safaris. Mm -hmm. And they were out and a leopard <clears throat> shot across in front of them from thicket to thicket, as they'll often do. So he drove around the thicket the leopard had gone into. There's no tracks coming out, so you know it's in there. And they spent about 15 minutes and he's doing that, he's peering under the bush. And you're just trying to find, you know it's sitting in there and you know it's watching you, but leopards being as elusive as they are, uh, you know it's seen you the entire time and you can't see yeah. it. And eventually the Secret Service guy just had a light bulb and goes, oh, hang on, reached into his duffel bag of tricks and he pulled out a thermal scanner and he just went, there it is. <laughs> and it was that thing of, oh, so cool. Cheating, cheating, but really, yeah. really cool. Yeah, that's cool. That is really it, cool. It is. And I've often thought, gosh, we could see so much more if we sent up drones and then we did have thermal scanners and, I mean, I, I would presume I've driven past a hundred leopards for every one that I've actually totally been alerted to. Um, if if not more, maybe I'm flattering myself with that number. <laughs> no, I'm sure you have. I mean, we we all tell stories of that that you know every time I go down to the tropics, um, a jaguar has seen us. We just haven't seen it. Oh, you know? yeah. <laughs> like, no, I mean, yeah, absolutely. Totally. In fact, it, and it's it's probably the more those smaller cats as well. You know, oh, for sure, pilots and all of those things. Oh, yeah. Many times have they just sat and they, they've just used stillness. Yeah. Uh, and you've gone so right past them. So uh, patient. And they're stealthy. I remember hearing a, a friend that owned, um, he just bought into like an eco lodge in Bolivia. This is many years ago. And he uh, was going on his morning run as he does down the trail. Uh, like most mornings he was down there scouting it out. And one morning he looked off to the side and there about 10 feet into the forest, you know, dark impenetrable jungle in, in, in Bolivia. Um, there was a jaguar just keeping pace with him over trees, under branches, not wow. making a sound, not a single yeah. leaf crinkle, not a single vine out of place. And that that always reminds me like these critters are so advanced. You know, we, yeah. we think that it takes our technology and our remote cameras. But, you know, getting back to the whole value of wildlife and, and insects, like we, we, got, we got a lot to learn from these things. And I love hearing yeah. these stories of you know, how we're able to, you know, biomimicry, like look at the elusive cat, you know, what, what is it doing? What, are, what is the consistency in, in um, like rigidity of its pads? Like how is it able to cushion those steps so well? It's cool stuff. But well, that's, that's what I'm fascinated by as well. And, and, I, and I talk about conservation. It's you don't need to like animals to be into conservation. You mentioned earlier all of the, the medications that have come from them. Mm -hmm. I always describe it as it's three point, every living thing, Blade of grass, panda, leopard um, is 3.2 billion years worth of research. Mm -hmm. Failures and successes to get to this point that they've overcome challenges that we're perhaps now facing. Uh, we know that elephants get cancer but never die from it, and we're starting to figure that one out. Uh, they may well hold the cure for several human cancers. Because cancer's not cancer, there's lots of different types. Uh, great white shark seemingly don't many sharks don't. I mean the Greenland shark lives hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years it's got some tricks that we need to learn from mm -hmm. the value of these even if you don't want them for aesthetic purposes even if you don't want them just because you think they deserve to be alive they're going to save you or someone you love totally yeah exactly and there's another interesting one to add to that going back to the monarch butterflies something I always love to talk about in my present presentations about about the migration is monarchs have figured out a way to turn certain genes on and off as they approach that migratory generation and they increase their lifespan by four times. That's an wow. interesting thing we could learn from. I mean, how and why and how can we, you know, I often say that to audiences and people are like, I wouldn't want to live four times as long. But, you know, <laughs> okay, that's fine. Some people would, but what about four times as long for agricultural products? What about four times as long um, if people have terminal illnesses, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So yeah, uh, another really interesting. Can we not give that secret to Rupert Murdoch? <laughs> yeah. Seal. <laughs> Seal. Yeah. yeah, we're gonna we're gonna snip this little bit out. Um 
Okay, so actually something triggered, it was a question I've written down, but triggered by something you said was, what is the most uncomfortable you've ever been to get a photograph and was it worth it? Oh, the most uncomfortable. Um, I would say it was probably um, in kind of like the wetland swamps of Papua New Guinea for photographing wow. birds yeah. of paradise um, deep in the Karawari River area, kind of like the, the Sepik River, uh, the bigger river, the Karawari is a tributary. And, you know, Papua New Guinea is famed for these extraordinary birds of paradise. And you, you actually can see them pretty well. Um, but it turns out that those guys that wait, you know, for five months straight to get that one photo, um, <laughs> your photo is not going to look like that. <laughs> so I, I'm yeah. deep in this, this swampy, brushy, and it was, it was probably the, the most mosquito bites I've ever gotten in a single period of time. Um, just coming back with like, welts all over my legs and, you know, you're kind of in the middle of nowhere where I'm not, you know. I'm not, I'm actually not usually worried about mosquito bites, especially in the States. Um, I, I guess sometimes you should be, but that's a place where I'm like, man, who knows what the hell is out here? Yeah, um, so, yeah. so yeah. And I was there for a couple hours before sunrise waiting for this. Um, which one was it? I think it was the King's bird of paradise or the, the 12 wired. It was one of these really cool ones that you see. And of course, you know, we see it and we get the photos and it's just like this blurry silhouette. I'm like, well, Okay, lesson learned. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's, it's worth it for the experience and to know how much I can go, <laughs> and to know that you can actually see these things. But no, I don't even know if I saved the photo. <laughs> yeah, I, and that's I, I think again, people sometimes wonder why is it that Africa's got such a successful ecotourism model, the the photographic safari, and uh, well, Southern Africa in parts and East Africa in parts, but the jungles parts don't. It's just, it's bloody hard to get a photo. And if there's an elephant crossing the savanna, you can watch him for half an hour in the open and there's nowhere to go. When you've got a, a gorilla, for example, that's a big animal, but it's shy. It lives in a really dense environment. It can just step sideways. It's behind a tree and it takes two, three steps. And yeah, there's no way you can get through the vegetation that it can. It's incredible. That and we, we've lost that. The strength left our shoulders long ago. We crashed to the ground. And we're bipeds, and we're going to live with it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, it's it's much much harder to get those kind of quality photographs, and 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 even just the viewing, if that's what you're after, is just a. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I it's mean, so harder. if you think about the African safari, I mean, it really, it's got everything. You know, you can do so in relative comfort because you you don't have to hike for miles. You don't have to be on ground with animals if you don't want to. You're in this you know sort of comfy cruiser and and you can travel miles in a day uh it's it's extraordinary and then with all that you're seeing the biggest best wildlife on earth you know yeah. like it, it it does take a little bit of um convincing a little bit of salesmanship to convince people that you know like watching some of the smaller critters in the world is so pleasurable now once you understand the whole story of leaf cutter ants they get pretty jagged but you don't really yeah. need to explain the story of a cheetah or a lion to get people just melting when they see it, you know, it's just, it's so like impressive. So yeah. After yeah I mean, I, I, again, personal experience, I know very well that people have a certain anxiety until they've seen lions and elephants in particular, those two, once they've got those, even if they've been out many times, they kind of notice, we haven't seen an elephant yet. And I said, well, I'd, I'd like to see a big male lion just because you, know, you always like to see one of those. Yeah. The moment they're sitting with a lion and it's sleeping as they do predominantly, can we go back to those animals that were doing stuff? <laughs> yeah, lazy cats. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I've had people say, we're watching a cheetah hunting. It's like, this cheetah is hungry. It's going to make a kill today. This is your once in a lifetime opportunity to watch a cheetah and that acceleration, which looks fake when you see it in real life. Um, I, mean, I love it. And in documentary stuff, you see it when the cheetah just takes off and the camera takes a bit to pan and actually find oh, it. Oh, yeah. You can't even spin at the waist with <laughs> as fast as the cheetah's moving. No, it's uh, unreal. And you see that, and you've got those people go, yeah, but yeah, we haven't seen a lion. Has anybody else seen a lion? Can we go see a lion? You know, um, yeah. disappointment this way. Um, but I'd say, yeah, I've, I've been through similar levels of discomfort and also got really crap photos. Uh, this is a really important one, I think, and it is something that I think 
people in conservation are going back to the communication uh, where we, we all fall down a bit is, uh, what good news do you have? Hmm. Well, so, you know, I think in terms, so there's, there is some great good news out there. I think one of the biggest uh, kind of inter medial or sort of incremental victories we've got right now going on in the in the US and the states uh, is with the pebble mine battle. I don't know if you've heard of this. It's it's probably uh, not made a ton of international news. It's it's a bit of a euphemism for this large um, open pit copper and gold mine that's supposed to be situated right on Bristol Bay, Alaska, which is the uh, US's largest fishery. Um, like 50% okay. of all wild caught seafood in the US comes from this area. And wow. for a couple of decades now, uh, a, a bunch of different mining companies have tried to buy into this idea of establishing this big deep water port and this huge infrastructure of roadways and all these barracks. And, and of course, this big seeping mine. Um, and uh, most local Alaskans uh, oppose it. Uh, it is generally thought of as not a good thing for economies. It would decimate the bear watching tourism, which is in itself spectacular and growing. Um, it's a big thing that uh, I work on and it's just a great thing. Um, you, you know, talking about wilderness and the idea of big charismatic wildlife, you know, we don't have a ton of it, uh, true wilderness and true big wildlife left in the US. We got to protect what we got. Anyway, long story short, um, through battle after battle, uh, the two Alaska senators have uh, verbally opposed uh, the pebble mine. It was like very last step of review. Like it could have wow. gone through any day. Now they verbally opposed it. Um, believe it or not, uh, one of Donald Trump's sons has verbally opposed it saying it'd be bad for hunting, oh, bad for sportsmen. Uh, okay. Where, you know, I, I firmly think that there, there can absolutely be partnership and collaboration between hunting communities and conservation communities because you've yeah. got to save the area. You know, this could go into a whole other controversial topic, but you know, so anyway, good, good thing there. Um, and a, I think a big victory. I mean, I think that, you know, not only is the battle won, but I think the war could be pretty close to being won as well on this specific mine. So that's a great thing. we got to take the victories as we get them, you know, other, other sort of good news out there. Um, you know, I, I think that this is sort of a weird way to put it, but I, I don't think there's ever been a point in the earth's history where there are more people with better knowledge about biology, about conservation and about science. Um, now, maybe the percentage is getting skewed as we hear, you know, various wars on science and all that. But but the truth is there there are more people by the numbers that care about it, that study it, that do it for profession, that post about it, that write about it than ever before. And, you know, even though the percentage might be not where we want it to be, the, the sheer numbers, it's only a, it's a matter of numbers before the next great um, E.O. Wilson figure is going to come up before the next great Jane Goodall is going to come up before the next great, yeah. you know, conservation hero, because all it takes is one person, you know, the Attenborough to inspire us all. So the fact that we have significantly more now than we did five years ago and way more now than we did 20 years ago, I think is a really, really great thing. We've yeah, we've got, I didn't consider that. So that is a real positive. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've got battles. We've got big battles coming up. And mm. because we know so much more, we also know how bad things are looking and can be. But nevertheless, I, I think you've got to, if nothing else, you've got to know or believe that we do know more about the natural world and we care more about the natural world on a, you know, per capita basis than ever, ever. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is extraordinary, but now we're seeing governments realize these economic impacts and it's, we're in a very strange time now where I think for the first time in a long time, economists and conservationists, there's, you, you spoke about the uncomfortable partnership between the hunting uh, crowds and conservationists. Hunters would proclaim they are conservationists and I'll take issue with that, but that's a longer story. But um, hunters in the US, different story. There's elsewhere or other stories. But economists, you know, with this bizarre mantra of growth is the only, uh, population growth is the way to economic growth. I think I'm now starting to wind back and start, uh, obviously that model doesn't take in finite resources. Uh, if you're trying to build an economy out of dodos and you're going through and it's like, hey, we're about to kill the last dodo, there's your model failing. And we are killing the last dodo around the world. But I think economists are finally looking at it and going, Oh, okay. And so when, as I said, you get China figuring out farm cockroaches using food waste, mm -hmm. win, 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 win across the board. And that's done for economic reasons. There happens to be a positive knock-on effect. Yep. Um, and similarly, I mean, again, we're seeing great 
great strides being made in China with green buildings. Right. And they're doing that to reduce the pollution that they're, they're suffering through. And they are pioneering so much. You know, the, the rest of the world is lagging behind in that. And again, yes, the, the positive is it's taken a negative to get to this. It's unfortunate. But these technologies will become globally available and improve the quality of life for humans. But also, we're going to be able to see some animals come back into our environments, yeah. not just foxes and peregrines and uh, you know the rats and mice that we associate with cities. We're going to see some cool stuff moving back in. Oh, yeah. And I mean, I think that's that's a, a big point for my long-term hope. You know, I mean, when you hear bad news about environments being decimated or whatever, the truth is that earth and nature is really, really resilient. Um, things bounce back um, in a very robust way, in a very quick way. I mean, the average tropical jungle can return to like 90% of its original kind of efficacy within a century. Um, and within yeah. two centuries, you, you almost can't tell the difference between um, a secondary forest being like one that's been logged completely and a primary forest. Now, there's a couple tree species that you wouldn't find, a couple big, big emergent trees. But you give life, you know, one or 200 years and it's going to bounce back monumentally. We just got to give it a break in the meantime. Um, and we, we it's, gotta that, <laughs> it's that extraordinary, you know, the, you, the, the smallest toehold. And nature says, I'll put something right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I spent a lot of time in the skeleton coast in Namibia, and that is the oldest desert in the world. It's the second driest after the Atacama, which is why it's so fascinating is not just how dry it is, less than a centimeter rain a year, but because it's 14 million years old, there's a massive amount that has evolved for that particular niche. Mm -hmm. And you're convinced nothing can survive out there. And then you realize that the pebbles are not pebbles, they're plants, life ops, also called the Bushman's buttocks, and, and, and they are camouflaged as that so they don't get eaten by the antelopes that live out there. Uh, and you know, I've seen ostrich running along the beach. Uh, lions have just found the seals again. First time in a quarter of a century, the lions have found, you know, lions eating seals on a beach, and there's no fresh water for you know, 50 kilometers. You know, life finding a way, I, I, I just absolutely love that. Uh, I mean, this is the kind of conversation I imagine you and I could sit having for hours and hours and hours. Everybody else has gone to bed. The staff. <laughs> I want to kill this, spike their drinks. For the nerd <laughs> only. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the funny thing is, well, if you're a safari guide or a wildlife guide, people think that you're cool. I've never been cool in my life. <laughs> And I'm really comfortable with that now. I think that's the thing, is being comfortable with your nerdiness is, is what goes yeah. the long way. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love sitting and, and getting into these more and more obscure minutiae of, of mm -hmm. the, the world. And it, it, to me, it is fascinating. And I understand it's not everybody's cup of tea, but it's great to meet someone like yourself. Uh, we can learn so much from. So next time in Boulder, I'll make sure I swing through. Yeah. I'm about to get mobbed by the two wildest animals on the planet. Children. <laughs> hey, we've just had a time change here, so they are now late for bed by an hour. Um, I'm hoping we can chat again. I think we could mm. talk about hours, conservation, wildlife. I think we, it'd be really good to talk about hunting since we've touched on it, but also tourism and its value of conservation. What yeah. And that's, so, you know, I, it's funny, like that's, that's the big news here is, you know, how yeah. does tourism add value to natural landscapes? And that's something that I, well, it's, it's my life work and it's a lot of your life's work. Yeah. Um, and I think that's like the, the other big piece of good news is that we, we now know how we can add a value to animals and to ecosystems that, is anywhere from five to 5,000 times the value of the next best thing, of the deleterious yes. thing, of the mining, of the deforestation, of the habitat conversion. Tourism is a way to make a heck of a lot more money, whether you like conservation or not. You will make more exactly. money. And that, I think that's what we've needed for so long. And that's why I'm full steam ahead and you know totally in fifth gear on this, this conservation travel thing. So yeah, let's certainly talk more on it. That's it. You, you might be our, our first repeat guest. Honored. Well, thanks so much for your time. I know it's your morning, my evening. Uh, dark and bitterly cold here in the UK, as it does so well. Um, but we will chat again soon, I hope. And uh, hopefully borders open and we can actually, maybe the next one we get to do with a beer in hand and 
one of those fine places in Colorado. That'd be great. Yeah, I look forward to it. Please keep me posted on your travels. Great. Thanks, Cool. Uh, okay, cheers, Peter. We will chat again soon. Okay. It's been fun. Thank you so much.